um, as a gentle reminder, we are recording this session, uh, primarily for notes purposes and as a follow up for those who are unable to attend. So um, on behalf of our production team today, we do have uh, my colleagues Gabby Moore and Ify in the space. Uh, they're going to be able to provide any sort of audio or technical support in the chat should you need it. And then we also have our two moderators for today's session, Paul Nelson and Allison Harrell, who are both on the digital finance team. So um, if you do have any questions throughout the session, please do feel free to type them into chat and we'll be sure that they are saved and addressed at a later time. Uh, with that, let us dive into the session now. Paul, on over to you. All right, morning, everyone. Sorry, I was just unmuting my uh, my phone. Um, my name is Paul Nelson. I'm a senior advisor on the digital finance team, as Janina said. And uh, I'm really excited to have Evo and Sean here today. We've worked with them for a number of years. Uh, you, some of you may know that USAID is a funder of CGAP. And um, through some work that we've done through a couple other partners, we've also been involved with some uh, regulatory sandbox efforts as well that involve Sean. Um, uh, Evo is with CGAP, which some of you may know is a leading source of insight and guidance on financial inclusion, um, how to responsibly use technology to advance economic empowerment and those sorts of issues. Uh, and at CGAP, Evo has uh, led a range of work on regulatory innovation, capacity building with financial authorities and other initiatives. And then Sean, Sean Duff, he's a VP of strategy with Kiva. And what's worth noting here is that Sean has also led and or helped lead the development of Kiva's uh, uh, Kiva protocol, which is in, a, in essence, a new approach to credit reporting data. So Sean, I'm sure may go into a little bit more detail about what that means, but the salient point about that is that Sean has looked at these issues from the side of, or the perspective of an innovator hoping to do something different, new, unfamiliar, uh, in a in a financial sector context, so you know here obviously we're talking about how do we enable more innovation in finance. Um, sandboxes seem popular. Many people seem to want to go back to their childhood, I think, and for maybe that reason alone, it's become the most popular uh, form, seemingly, uh, of uh, uh, innovation uh, efforts that financial authorities have pursued around the world. Uh, but there's a critical question: Do they work? Are they effective? I think ultimately, as Evo and Sean will discuss, um, they're a tool that is suitable for achieving certain tasks. And the question is whether, uh, what, whether there are other tools available to us that might be uh, equally effective or effective in different ways, given the objective that we have or that our um, partner financial authorities may have. So today, I know many of you are involved in either broader business enabling environment efforts. Some of you may lead work in financial sector development. Some of you may be focused specifically on FinTech or financial inclusion. Um, but I would just emphasize that some of the points that Evo and Sean will talk about today are applicable broadly to work on enabling environment issues and fostering innovation. Uh, many regulators in different sectors and different domains also think about this. And some of the, some of the uh, methods of approach and analysis that Sean and Eva will discuss might be relevant in those areas as well, even though they speak to the financial sector context. Uh, so I think one thing for me that I'm most curious about as, a, uh, as someone at USAID focused on innovation in the financial sector context and in the digital economy context um, is what other tools beyond sandboxes are available to us? And how can we as a donor, how can we as a development agency uh, develop interventions or collaborations with authorities to to um, effectively use these tools. So that's the, that's the perspective that I'm looking at this from, and and we'll be interested in hearing your perspectives on the line. I know we have folks from USAID as well as a range of other uh, partners on the line. So um, with that, I would just note that uh, Allison will be 
paying attention to questions and chats that are made in the sidebar. So don't at all hesitate to make your own comments or observations or, or hard questions for the, for the hosts. Uh, Sean and Eva will do their best to answer them. And, uh, and you know, we know that you all have a lot of experience working in these areas. So we don't want you to sit on the sidelines during this discussion. We want you to jump in and share your perspective. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to our speakers of the hour, Sean and Evo. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for a great introduction. Also, thank you very much, uh, USAID, for, for having us and for giving us the opportunity to share our work on regulatory sandboxes and innovation facilitators with uh, this great audience. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Ivo Inik, and together with Sean, uh, we've been leading the work on uh, regulatory uh, approaches to innovation, innovation facilitators, and most specifically, regulatory sandboxes. I guess we're going to answer that question whether they are our most popular tool or not. Uh, we will also attempt to answer the question whether they work or not, so stay tuned. We'll get into that very quickly. On the next slide, um, and maybe the one after next, um, you will see what is our packed agenda for the next 90 or so minutes. So we're going to first give you an overview of the current landscape, giving you sort of a taste of what's happening in the space of regulatory sandboxes all, or, all around the world. And maybe what are some emerging insights that we see a similar across different jurisdictions. And then we'll, I, I think we'll get into the core of the, the presentation, really answering the question whether you need or not a regulatory sandbox, either as a regulator or as a consultant or technical assistance provider working with a regulator. So we'll get into that and, and try to answer that question in a sort of a normative manner. Uh, so hopefully you'll find it uh, useful. And then we'll get into a more specifics on how to design a sandbox that's really suitable for your needs if you decide to design a sandbox in the first place. And after that, we'll present very quickly the toolkit that SIGA has put together, which should help um, people like you in the audience to, to really work either on regulatory sandboxes initiatives of their own or of their own clients. Um, and after that, uh, as, as promised at the beginning, We'll also do a team exercise where we will walk you through some background information and let you discuss and then share uh, your insights through the um, through the chat uh, and maybe even uh, orally. So that's the packed agenda that we have for today. As mentioned, I encourage you to use the chat function to raise questions or uh, or comments or just to introduce yourself. Uh, we would like to engage with the audience, so don't hesitate to really not only post questions, but also argue maybe against what we're saying, if you d disagree or share examples from your own work, um, share the challenges that you're facing, um, because that's really how we can co-create this, this session. Uh, from the initial poll, I see that there is quite a bit of you who have been working on regulatory sandboxes. So uh, again, don't hesitate to share your experience with us. All right, let's go uh, directly to uh, the, the core agenda. So on the next slide, we do have um, uh, we do have a definition of what a sandbox is. So please, next slide. And this definition uh, focuses on the very utility of regulatory sandbox. Since we say that it is a tool for developing evidence about how a new product technology or business model in brief innovation works and the outcomes it produces when it interacts with the, the life marketplace. And this evidence gathering can help regulators to really decide on their regulatory action towards that specific innovation, be it coming up with a new regulatory framework or licensing that innovation under existing re, uh, licensing category or, or else. What I would like to emphasize here with this definition is really the focus on that utility, what it can do to, for, for, for regulators. Um, because we also did have another definition in our earlier paper in 2017, which was very much focused on how Sandbox looks like. We talked about Sandbox being a framework put in place by regulators to allow small scale live testing of innovation in the live marketplace. Um, that definition is still very much true and, 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 and it works, but 
what we're trying to do in our new paper is really to shift from describing the sandbox and its sort of external feature towards focusing more on what it does and, 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 and how it is beneficial uh, for regulators. So let's move on. Um, the next slide shows the current situation with regulatory sandboxes. So this comes from my colleagues at the World Bank who, has mapped, uh, who have mapped out around 70 different sandboxes and they, they created this database that you can access and it does have this beautiful map which tells you the story of past five years uh, since the launch of the UK sandbox. Um, the, the tool has really become very popular and today we see it pretty much all around the world in green those are sandboxes or sandbox like activities that are operational in red are recently announced and the numbers obviously keep increasing. Now the other question is how are not only where they are but also how regulatory sandboxes are being used. So on the next slide you'll see a snapshot from our uh, from our analysis we did in 2019. So it's a, it's a little older, but it probably still does tell a very similar story to what we would find today. Um, we did analyze around 134, um, we did analyze 134 firms testing in around 16 regulatory sandboxes. And we just ask a, a, a couple of questions ourselves and then try to find answers. One of the questions uh, was, what is the technology that is being tested in regulatory sandboxes around the world? And you see the answer on the left, where not surprisingly, probably, uh, a lot is happening around the blockchain and crypto. A lot is also happening around data analytics. And then the other things that kept re re repeating on the radar screen were digital ID and online distribution. And then we have this sort of multiple technology involved or other technology involved category, which, which uh, had a different combinations and different types of, of technologies and answers. The other question we also ask, what are the sectors or, or product types that sort of benefit most from testing in regulatory sandbox? And here, perhaps again, not surprisingly, the most activity we found was in payments, um, followed by wholesale and infrastructure, which again, very often related to payments and had to do with things such as instant payments, clearing and settlements for payments or clearing and settlement for, for securities and the like, the, the sort of the back end API integration and, 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 and similar solutions. And then we have a one category that can be sort of labeled as uh, a wealth management, which has advice and asset management. And then the rest is sort of spread across uh, other, other product lines or, or sectors such as insurance, credit, savings, and, and other. On the very bottom of this slide, you see more specific examples, what, what we found instead being tested in sandboxes from equity crowdfunding to blockchain-based payments, uh, personal finance management tools, uh, alternative credit scoring, and, and more. So this is, just, this is just to give you a flavor of what's happening in the sandboxes. And now let's go very quickly over the next slide, which, you know, it's, it's almost like a mandatory slide, really. When you talk about sandboxes, uh, people like to hear about the benefits and the risks. And so, you know, I, um, I think I felt just the, the, the urge to really put this slide in, but I'm not going to go into, into details because I hope that as we go through this presentation, the benefits and risks will kind of clearly emerge in your minds from what we're saying about the sandboxes and how they work and how they've been implemented in different countries. But you'll get access to the presentation, I believe, so you can review them on your own. Now, the final sort of overview slide, um, which is the next one that I, I'd like to talk about um, before we get into a more interactive part is the question that CGAP really uh, was trying to answer from the very beginning, which is how regulatory sandboxes relate and maybe advance financial inclusion. And so again, you're seeing a data from the 2019 um, work where we did put a sort of a, a basic set of criteria to really assess whether innovation is inclusive or not, and then review those 134 firms um, to see that most of them work on innovation that's not really speaking directly to financial inclusion, but 20% of them were working on things 
uh, that were directly targeted at excluded and underserved segments. So we scored them as an inclusive innovation. And then we expanded the criteria uh, to be a little bit more benevolent in a way and say, you know, even if they're not targeting the excluded or underserved segment, if they're working on a product that's typically used by the excluded or underserved segment or, or uh, the segment benefits from it, let's include them too. So remittances, for example, or alternative credit scoring to cover people with no credit history. And so with that, we arrived at the aggregate number of 38% of innovation tested in that relatively small, small, small sample. So we can take it as a proxy of the impact for now, but you know, it's been two years, maybe it's, it's a time for, for uh, another round of analysis. Now, what I would like to do next, uh, so next slide, is just to engage with, uh, with all of you and go through this very quick through an, uh, or false exercise. So I have a set of claims prepared, and I'd like to invite you to use the polling function to answer whether you think the claim is true or, or false. So let's start on the next slide where the claim says, regulatory sandboxes are great for interaction with a large number of fintechs. So um, if you think that's true, obviously it's true. If you don't think that that's the case, um, then, then vote for false. Uh, I, I don't know how long we should be waiting, but I see that we've got a majority of votes and the participation is is slightly growing. I think we're we're surpassing the participation rate for many elections um, around the world. So I think we may just hit pause here. And interestingly enough, okay, so a slight, slightly more participants think that this is a false statement, but it's pretty tight, um, which which is interesting. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, there's sort of answer to the question, not, not necessarily on the ne next slide, but here we know, that we, here we see that regulatory sandboxes are definitely a very popular tool. In fact, and these are numbers that are coming from a different work. It's a survey that we conducted together with the World Bank asking regulators a set of question, questions. And here we see that regulatory sandboxes are the most popular innovation facilitator that we see around the world. The other innovation facilitators would include innovation hubs, accelerators, you know, fintech offices, and so on. But sandboxes were trending trending very high. So I guess Paul's right saying that it might be the most popular tool. Now on the next slide, we also try to review, combine this with, with another data point and, and review how many how many inquiries from innovators are each of those innovation facilitators able to handle. In other words, which tool is more suitable for a large volume or large scale engagement with the industry? And sandboxes were not performing that well because you know they take some time, and after all, they're really um, they're really designed for a relatively small sample of firms with which you engage through extended period of time, uh, which the sandbox testing takes. So innovation hub or accelerator seem to be uh, much better suited for engaging with the industry and, and handling the larger volumes. Let's go to the next slide. And again, uh, I see some questions coming. Uh, please continue typing the questions that you may have. Uh, we will have a chance to go and review them and answer them um, uh, as, as we sort of pause in between different sections. So the next claim is the main benefit innovators get from Sandbox is improved access to funding. And again, if you think this claim is true, just uh, hit the true button. Um, so do you think that really the main benefit for innovators of a sandbox is they get better access to, to funding? All right, so votes are coming in very quickly. All right, let me wait a little more, but this time it's not as tight as, as in the previous instance. Um, all right, I think I think we can uh, we can end the poll since you see that majority of you think this is a false statement. So let's see. Let's go to the next slide. Um, here again, the survey we asked, you know, what is the main benefit that that innovation facilitators offer to participants, and it was the guidance really that uh, innovators get from the regulator in terms of compliance and how to 
become a licensed regulated institution. Now, the funding may be the case for some regulatory sandboxes, and you probably have seen reports saying that you know participating firms have benefited from easier access to venture capital, for example. So it might be true for some sandbox sandboxes, but looking at the sort of a, a more um, diverse sample, uh, that's not necessarily what we found. Let's go to the next one. And I believe that's our, um, okay, we have two more to go. So sandboxes heighten regulatory and consumer protection risk. That's another claim that you probably have already come across. So regulatory sandboxes are creating uh, a dangers or are increasing the risks that customers face. Is that true or false? Um, right, we, we're getting our quorum almost. So let's wait a little bit more. Um, all right, well, I think we're there. Okay, so it's a little tighter, but it's still pretty clear that most of you think it's it's a false statement. And here I don't have a I don't have really a good answer to you, so I may disappoint. If you go to the next slide, we didn't quite measure the actual risk to customers. We did inquiry about the number of complaints, and you know there there was no indication that uh, the regulatory sandbox generates more complaints, for example. But what we've definitely found is that regulators pay a lot of attention to customer risks, and so the safeguards that they put in place during the testing period are very much focused on consumer protection. And they involve things such as disclosure requirements, limiting number of clients who can participate in the sandbox, um, having in place complaints handling mechanisms so that if something goes wrong, the, the, the complaint is addressed properly, and so on and so forth. So even if sandbox may come with more risks, regulators are definitely putting in place and mitigating factors. So this is by the way of sort of introduction, overview and landscaping. Uh, maybe let, let me turn to the USAID colleagues to ask whether there are any questions that we may want to address before I pass the mic to Sean. Yeah, it looks like we've got a couple questions coming in. Um, so I think this kind of last section you touched on uh, might address this, but I will pose it anyways. Um, so the question is, I've, I've heard it said that a regulatory sandbox is like trying to understand a tiger by studying a house cat. You can understand 95% of the tiger, but it's the other 5% that's going to kill you. <laughs> how, how can you avoid the pitfalls of regulatory sandboxes, especially the idea that sandboxes could give regulators a false sense of security when launching fintech economy-wide? So I think you kind of addressed some of the safeguards, but I'll just see if, if there's anything else you want to add to that uh, question. Okay, this is a great question, and it's also a great segue to the next section on deciding when Sandbox is a suitable tool and when it is not. The one point that I will make is that because the testing is usually uh, limited in scope and scale, it indeed may run the risk that you don't quite see how the innovation engage with the marketplace once it scale up. Um, so regulators need to be aware of that and need to also um, assess the test and the, the testing results with this in their mind, knowing that they can only see a part of uh, the interaction between innovation and the mar marketplace. That said, um, very often when it comes to any innovation sort of, uh, there is an unknown, unknown component that regulators somehow need to, need to address and just make their best effort to do the risk analysis and, and mitigate the risks that they can foresee um, there will always be that unknown component that can lead to uh, potential harm. But uh, again, we'll get, we'll get into that uh, question as we go through the next section. So let's see whether there is another question or whether we should just uh, jump into it. Yeah, maybe one more, um, just kind of addressing some of the, the overview that you presented. Um, in addition to sandboxes, could you describe some of the other types of models? Like you were looking at uh, accelerators and innovation hubs. So maybe just a quick uh, high level definition of those two. Yeah, well, I, I, I could, but again, I leave it to Sean because that's part of that section when he will get into the alternatives. So maybe let's not, uh, let's not uh, skip ahead of that. We can, we can get to that uh, in the next section. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, 
Okay, then maybe this one. Uh, who has been driving regulatory sandboxes, government or innovators themselves? All right. Well, that's that's a really interesting question. And sorry, Alison, I didn't mean to, to disappoint, but I also don't want to uh, take away <laughs> from Sean what he's going to uh, present. So, who's driving the the, the regulatory sandboxes? You know, that's that's an interesting question because it really does depend. So the first sandbox we've seen was driven by this government analysis that focused on the competition in the financial market and kind of stated a known true that uh, the, the financial market is concentrated, not much innovation is happening there, and they were looking for different tools to change that. So that was kind of the, the I think, the initial impulse. Um, then a lot of the a lot of what we see is the sense of uh, we need to do something. You know, the world is changing. There's a lot of discussion about innovation, the dramatic changes in the financial sector due to technology. You know, there are emerging fintech hubs. You know, in Singapore, in in, in London, in, in in Hong Kong, and elsewhere. You know, we want to be part of this trend. So, what can we do? And 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 it very often leads to the regulatory sandbox as one of the po possible answers. And again, we would like to unwind this a little bit to really show whether that's that's how sandboxes work or should work. But it is to say that it's very often the regulator or the government who wants to signal to the market and the world that they're willing to accommodate innovation, they're inviting, inviting innovation to their market, and they're willing to put initiatives in place to, um, to do something. Now, very often throughout the consultation process where regulators ask the industry, do you want a regulatory sandbox? The answer is often yes, because you know the industry would go for anything that may sound as sort of a friendly treatment of, of, of innovation. So it's it's I wouldn't say that it's either or there there is a sort of consensus between the industry and regulators that yeah let's try you know let's let's do a sandbox and let's see what happens. But this is precisely why we focused on the topic and we, why we've tried to come up with a technical guide that puts some framework into that thinking and provides some guidance on when that decision to move ahead with regulatory sandbox may actually yield the expected outcomes and when it may lead to disappointment because it can't quite do what the stakeholders expect it to do. So may, maybe let me stop here with, with the answer because um, this is, in a way, really alluding to many things that we'll, uh, we'll touch upon as we go through this presentation. Sean, I guess it may be over to you. That's it. It's over to me. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Evo, Paul, and USAID colleagues. And, and thank you all for the, for the great commentary in the chat. And as, as Evo said, you know, the, the flavor of these questions is, is really why, what motivated us to, to write this toolkit. Um, and, and, and let me just... But before diving into the next section, let me just provide some context because I think the comments are are, are spot on. Um, you know, we created this the, the toolkit that we'll introduce here. You know, based on several years of researching and working with and supporting uh, regulatory uh, facilitation efforts globally, uh, with a specific focus on sandbox. Um, as as the commentators have noted, and as the the research shows. Um, this is such a popular tool, um, but it's also been so kind of uh, widely misconstrued in many ways, both on the, 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 the marketplace side, you know, uh, uh, innovators thinking that, you know, sandboxes were in some sense a free pass uh, for, for, for entering the regulated uh, space without going through the, the, the requisite licensing or compliance exercises. And then on the other hand, on the regulator side, uh, you know, we've often seen sandboxes misconstrued as sort of a, a comprehensive innovation uh, policy. Um, the, the, the reality is, is somewhere in between. And I think as, as, as Paul just noted in the chat, there is this other interesting uh, feature to sandboxes, which is really kind of opening up uh, a dialogue uh, between uh, regulators and the industry. Sandboxes may be one way of doing that, but there are others, uh, innovation offices, hubs, accelerators, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Um, but the, 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 the toolkit is really intended to be um, a, a stylized analytical approach to unpacking the circumstances under which you know, a sandbox is appropriate on the one hand, and then the whole range of other circumstances where sandbox might not be the right approach. Um, and so the, the, the toolkit is, is really designed to get at that set of questions. Um, if we could roll forward one slide, please. Um, 
and we'll see here the you know we start with this this very clear sort of normative view that uh, you know sandboxes are great in this very narrow context you know in the context where you know live testing uh, and the generation of empirical evidence or observation is really necessary to help unblock a, a regulatory uncertainty. Um, and that there are beyond that circumstance, there may be other tools that are that are, are better suited to achieving uh, you know, a set of regulatory objectives. So keep that in mind. Uh, next, next slide, please. So, so what we've done here is, is provided this uh, you know, very stylized uh, kind of analytical approach to understanding you know, whether and when a, a regulator or a jurisdiction might need a regulatory sandbox. I'll just talk through it very, very quickly. It should all seem very obvious in some sense, um, but we've also felt that, uh, uh, you know, that, that asking a set of questions along these lines is actually really helpful to kind of focusing regulatory intention on, on the need for sandboxes. First is just, you know, a high level, you know, starting with objectives. What's the regulator trying to, to achieve with the sandbox? Um, and we can talk through what we see as some fairly common, uh, common motivations for sandboxes, uh, not all of which, uh, you know, evidence, um, uh, you know, a, a clear pathway to sandbox in, in particular jurisdictions. Um, next, we say that, uh, you know, we, we look at a set of regulatory uh, barriers uh, that, that may be uncovered in the objective setting process and try to understand, you know, when the sandbox approach might be useful in, um, in unblocking barriers to innovation. And then finally, step three, and this is kind of the question that came through the chat, assessing um, uh, alternatives uh, to sandboxes based on uh, the, this analytical approach. And we'll kind of talk through those uh, in some detail um, in the next few slides. So if we could roll forward one, please. Right, so um, start with, uh, if you're consulting with a, a central bank or you're a prudential regulator um, and you, uh, you think you want a sandbox, <laughs> uh, kind of a critical first question is to say, why? Uh, what, what is the objective you're trying to achieve um, with, uh, with the regulatory sandbox? We hear you know, two or three um, objectives commonly in the marketplace. One is just uh, regulators wanting to learn more about what's happening um, in, in, their, in their jurisdiction. Um, uh, again, sort of a, 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 a useful uh, uh, and completely reasonable objective with innovation moving so quickly. Um, but we often find that you know, because of the resource intensive nature and because Sandbox is focused on a very limited set of firms, that a learning objective isn't always the, the, the highest and best use um, of sandboxes. And we can talk about some of the alternatives here momentarily. Um, on the other side, there are um, uh, you know, motivations around promoting innovation or competition. Uh, the FCA uh, sandbox, which is really the, you know, the, the, the first uh, initiative in this space, um, you know, very much had uh, an innovation promotion objective in mind. Um, there are important questions there to ask uh, if that's appropriate in your jurisdiction, not least of which whether you have a statutory mandate um, to promote innovation or competition. Uh, many regulators don't. Um, and as we'll see shortly, I think there are other ways of, of promoting those objectives, uh, pr promoting innovation and competition in the marketplace that don't have anything to do with um, uh, or, or aren't necessarily advanced uh, through, uh, through sandbox testing environments. Um, I think where it gets very interesting and where sandbox you know, might come into play is this, this narrower set of objectives around you know, addressing uh, regulatory barriers to innovation. And it kind of goes without saying that you know, regulatory sandboxes are a tool um, that regulators can use uh, to, um, uh, you know, to answer or clarify regulatory hypotheses around the direction of innovation in the marketplace. And we see that, that it's really this, this intermediate category addressing barriers to innovation where sandboxes can have um, kind of unique applicability. So if we could roll forward one more slide, please. Great, and I think we, we, we've kind of talked through this piece here, but it's, it's worth uh, pausing at the moment just to highlight you know, that uh, you know, there are these range of other alternative interventions that regulators might contemplate in addition to sandboxes. We highlight some here. Um, other innovation facilitators might include things like, uh, you know, FinTech offices or, or even hotlines uh, to answer basic questions uh, from the marketplace. We see that, you know, many applications that come into formal sandbox programs are really questions about, um, you know, which particular uh, licensing regime might apply to new technology, you know, where to find the relevant forms, how to, how to pay fees and so forth. Uh, very sort of basic questions that, that can be answered through a much less cumbersome tool than regulatory sandboxes. 
Um, there are other tools uh, available, including just, just simple rule updates or policy updates or clarifications uh, that might be uh, kind of easier to apply on a market-wide basis um, than regulatory sandbox. We'll return to those in a moment, but, but just to, to highlight here, you know, how the objective setting relates to, um, you know, selection of the appropriate tool uh, to encourage innovation. Uh, next slide, please. Right, and we can actually roll forward through this one. This is just an example of, 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 one, of one objective stated by a central bank um, supporting their regulatory sandbox uh, initiative. Um, th th this is a practical matter. Step two is really sort of the, the in some sense, the, the, the heart of the analytical guide, sort of understanding, you know, when a sandbox can address a particular uh, regulatory barrier uh, to innovation. Again, here, there are, there are some common, uh, common barriers to, to innovation kind of flagged by market participants, which don't necessarily um, uh, require, you know, all of the, all of the work of, 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 of a sandbox environment. Some might just be that, you know, compliance is costly um, or that, uh, uh, you know, some regulation is, is just outright prohibitive of, of certain types of innovations in the marketplace. Um, again, not, not always uh, clear that uh, those particular barriers to innovation are, are solved um, in the sandbox context. Um, you know, we've seen on the, the issue of kind of uh, costly compliance or just even understanding, um, you know, what the right or appropriate licensing regime is for, for a new technology can be solved by something as simple as you know, clarifying language on, on a website or, or making you know, forms and processes more, um, uh, uh, more available or transparent uh, to, to market participants. But it's really this because intermediate category here where, where a regulatory uncertainty can be resolved uh, uh, um, effectively through live testing uh, is when we see Sandbox having its greatest, uh, its greatest application. Uh, so roll forward one slide, please. Terrific. Um, so just to, just to pause here um, and kind of, kind of restate the obvious, um, uh, you know, not every uh, innovation should necessarily reach the marketplace, and and um, you know, some uh, might fail uh, prior to even uh, you know hitting the regulatory process just by by virtue of poor product market fit or lack of commercial viability. Um, we see in you know early in some of the sandbox experiments. Um, you know, uh, firms testing really to assess commercial viability or whether the, you know, their, their, their beta will really even get off the ground. Again, don't necessarily view those use cases as, uh, as terribly appropriate for sandboxes, um, but more focusing on uh, sandbox testing on um, providing a, a base of evidence for a regulator to understand outputs from a technology uh, that might raise uh, regulatory uh, concerns. Let's roll forward one, please. And finally, sort of, this is where we've kind of uh, been uh, mentioning all along, you know, thinking about sandboxes as really one, one of among a many uh, potential tools available to regulators um, when, uh, you know, thinking about unblocking um, barriers to innovation. Um, again, we uh, often see that, uh, you know, or, or, or in, in our early consultations, uh, with, with many jurisdictions, you know, some regulators thinking about sandbox as a sort of a comprehensive innovation policy where, uh, you know, where um, kind of more uh, broad-based um, uh, rule changes uh, might be more beneficial or where more lightweight uh, programs such as, you know, FinTech offices or, or office hours um, being, uh, you know, a first step that they can use to, uh, you know, to engage with and learn from uh, market participants. So I think that might be, I'll we'll roll forward one slide, please, and might be ready to hand off. Yeah. So the next, uh, j j just to tee up this next section, maybe we can pause for some questions, but um, yeah, having, having run through that basic set of uh, kind of questions around whether a sandbox is uh, kind of the first best tool uh, for tackling an innovation challenge, um, we next provide in the, in the toolkit, uh, you know, a set of, of, of um, guides for understanding how to design a sandbox that's uh, that, that's tailor made for um, you know for specific jurisdictions and Eva will run through that, and then but perhaps I'll pause for USAID colleagues if there are any questions you'd like to um, address from the chat. Yeah, Evo has been doing a great job, uh, kind of responding and commenting in the chat. So let me just see if there's um, actually Evo. Is there anything you want to address verbally? Otherwise, we don't have any specific questions from Section Two yet. 
Well, you know, so first of all, really thanks for all the comments and, and questions and, and sharing experiences. This is absolutely amazing. And uh, I'm already learning quite a bit about some of the initiatives, for example, in Indonesia. So I, I, I really like that. Um, I'm wondering whether the question of alternatives and, and, and you know, the other innovation facilitators have been uh, answered uh, to the participant satisfaction. I, I believe I believe so, but we're happy to dive deeper uh, because in addition to the other innovation facilitators like the fintech offices and hubs, obviously regulators for years have been implementing different strategies and tactics, how to deal with innovation and uh, regulatory sandbox is just a continuation of, you know, a process of looking for, for tools. So uh, if there are questions regarding that, please uh, share them in the chat. We can come back to them. That sounds good. And I think there will be a way, any unanswered questions we can follow up with later. So why don't we move on? Thanks, Eva. All right, well, thanks, uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, let's move to the designing uh, section. So yeah, you can go to the next slide. Basically, this section is for those who've decided that regulatory sandbox is really something that they want to do, right? So um, I'm not encouraging those of you who who don't want to have a sandbox to sign off, but I'm just uh, making that clear that really it, this is the next step. You've decided you want a sandbox. So the question that we've tried to answer is whether there is any particular design that corresponds to a specific circumstances in which any regulatory sandbox operates. In other words, um, does it really matter how you design a regulatory sandbox or can you just take a blueprint from any other country having a sandbox and copy it in, in your own uh, framework? Um, the reason why we ask the question is that when you look at the regulatory sandboxes and there are, again, as I mentioned, close to 70 or maybe over 70 of them around the world, when you look from, at them from the very high level perspective, you'll see that they look all the light or all alike. They have five similar design elements that they all share. They define who's eligible for the sandbox testing. They define the governance structure. They define the timing for applications and for tests. They also define test restrictions and, and what are the exit options. Where it gets really interesting is that each of those design elements has multiple design choices that you can choose from. And so our question was, are there any sort of external circumstances that drive those choices? And are some choices better than others? And we've come up with three threshold constraints, as, as we call them, uh, which consist of the legal framework, market conditions, and capacity, and which we believe are really key to determine what, how to design, how to design regulatory sandbox. So when you go to the next slide, I, I hope it will become a little clear what I mean. So here we have a more detailed look at those design elements. So I said there are five of them. So let's, let's just go very quickly through through them. Eligibility criteria, which determines who can test in a sandbox and who cannot. Uh, there is a variety of design choices. Some regulatory sandboxes are open only to fintech startups or sort of the new entrants. Some are open only to incumbents. Some are open to a combination of the two, obviously. And some are even open to firms that are not aspiring financial or existing financial service providers, but are providing a sort of non-financial solutions such as rected companies. So a great var variety um, of, of what, you know, what, what we see. Um, the same is true for governance. Again, how the sandbox operates, who runs the sandbox internally? Is it a dedicated unit? Is it a, a sort of a, a consortium, if you will, of units of the regulator? Is it a small or large team? How do they communicate? Who decides who gets into sandbox? Who decides how the sandbox test, um, how, how the firm exits the sandbox and so on and so forth? Um, and so we could basically go one by one and see the variety of choices that regulators have. And once you start combining them across the five design elements, you can really arrive to a very different designs of regulatory sandboxes. And that's why we thought, well, there must be something driving those choices. There must be choices that are better for a specific set of circumstances than, than others. And, and so what are those circumstances and how we can match those design choices to those specific circumstances. So on the next slide, um, I will 
uh, maybe let's go to the two slides back, actually. Um, I want, yes. So I mentioned those. I mentioned those three threshold constraints, and maybe I should say a little bit more about them before we get to the slide where I wanted to illustrate how the toolkit works. Um, so first, legal framework. Legal and regulatory framework determines a number of things. First of all, whether the regulator can even put a regulatory sandbox in place and how. Is it through regulation? Is it through guidance? Is it through a change of law? Um, and how far they can go in determining, for example, eligibility criteria or exit options. So when I mentioned that some sandboxes are only open to already existing licensed financial service providers, that's largely dictated by the existing legal and regulatory framework. Um, so that's just one example. So I think legal and regulatory framework is really uh, kind of essential constraint or, or threshold constraint. There, then there is a market conditions, which is largely about how many innovations and innovators are operating or potentially interested in the market? You know, are you operating in a vibrant fintech um, landscape or do you see just a few innovators that are trying to do something but it's really at, the, at a small scale? Are you seeing a big interest from outside, firms that want to come to your market or is most innovation local and, 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 and happening locally? So these are some of the market conditions Obviously, also the capacity of the market to, uh, to sort of absorb new entrants and, and new innovations. And that capacity of the market is also, the flip side of it, is the capacity of the regulator to really handle regulatory sandbox. Because again, um, it's an initiative that requires certain resources, attention, and, and effort. So does regulator have enough capacity to, uh, to implement the regulatory sandbox initiative? So now when you skip... Uh, to the next slide, yes, this, this, um, the previous one, this will show you what we, uh, can you go to the previous slide, slide please? It will show you what we try to do in, uh, in the technical guide. We basically came up with pairs of those threshold constraints and design choices. And we suggest exactly what I mentioned at the beginning. There are some better design choices than others drive, driven by the Threshold constraint. So this is just illustration um, where we compared sort of the high capacity um, as the capacity threshold constraint and high demand as the market conditions uh, threshold constraint and low capacity and low demand. And uh, you see that if you have a high capacity as a regulator and also you see high demand in your market, um, you can design your sandbox as a cohort based sandbox, for example. So instead of allowing innovators to apply on, the, on, on an ongoing basis, you create cohorts that you launch in a certain period of time, which allows you to better manage the high volume of applications and interest from the market. Um, because of high capacity, you can afford to have a dedicated sandbox team that really fully uh, focuses on dealing with the innovations, walking them through the application and sandbox process. Um, and just, just making sure that the sandbox really handles that, that high demand. Um, you can afford to have a subject matter expert so that you can open sandbox to whatever innovation uh, may be uh, or whatever innovator may be coming to your sandbox instead of, for example, focusing on innovation in a certain area where you have an expertise. Um, and that's something that we may talk about later, the difference between sandboxes that kind of welcome any innovation versus sandboxes that are thematic and specifically welcome innovation in a certain area, for example, in remote onboarding. Um, um, so, so this is sort of high demand, high capacity. Then on the opposite side of the spectrum is when the regulator has low capacity and there's also low demand in the market for, uh, for innovation facilitators such as sandbox, then probably sandbox is not an option. Uh, there's no demand, there's no capacity. There might be other tools that may be more appropriate in under those circumstances, such as uh, innovation uh, office, for example. So again, when you go to the, our toolkit, we go by, by sort of one by one and talk about the, the design choices and the threshold constraints and how they interplay. So the next slide, please. Um, so this is something that I've just very quickly addressed which is the exit scenarios um, because 
that's um, the exit scenario is one of the key design elements, and it's also the one that is quite affected by the legal and regulatory framework. In other words, what can happen once the sandbox test is, is over is the exit scenarios that we're talking about. You see that at the sort of the middle of the, the schematic um, uh, of, the, of the scheme is the, the three different options. The test fails, the test is discontinued for a number of reasons, or the test is successful. So I'll just focus on what happens when the test is successful, because that's the desired really outcome of, of the test. And even if the test is successful, there are multiple options of how the firm can exit from the sandbox or what can happen in response. Regulator may still decide to issue a cease and desist order because the innovation may work, but may not be deemed really appropriate or beneficial to the market. Um, the other option is that the regulator may decide to grant a license or other form of, form of approval under the existing licensing or, or authorization options. So that's almost like the smoothest scenario. The test is over, the regulator sees, okay, I can license this innovation as you know, financial advice, for example, grants the license and the firm exits and operates in the market. Now, where we think, what we would like to see probably more as an exit scenario from the sandbox in the context of what Sean was talking about, is where regulatory sandbox test points to a need of regulatory change. Um, and that regulatory change may really need adopting new rules, or it just may mean adjusting how rules are being implemented or, or inter interpreted. This is a tricky one because it may take more time. And so regulators need to understand or need to know what is going to happen if at the end of the sandbox test, the only option is to come up with the new rules um, before the firm can hit the, the, the marketplace. And so we've seen that some regulators um, have adopted the approach where the sandbox testing can be extended for another year or two, which gives the regulator enough time, hopefully, to adopt the regulatory change before the firm really exits from the sandbox. And then the final scenario is that it's um, the regulator finds that the innovation is completely outside of the regulatory perimeter, either because it belongs under jurisdiction of another regulator or it's just simply not a regulated financial service provider or activity and shouldn't be regulated as such. So let me pause here. This is pretty much for the design uh, section and let's see whether there are any questions before we move on. Yeah, there's uh, one question that's uh, distinctly related to kind of talking through um, how these are designed. So the question is, amongst the sandboxes that have actually resulted in regulatory change, I'm interested to know what they have in common. So what are some of the factors like resources, design, market uptake that make it more likely to progress from sandbox to regulatory and legal change? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a question that I probably haven't really uh, pay enough attention to yet, but uh, just running quickly through the the examples that I'm a, aware of, I would say that one of the um, one of the commonalities is first the awareness that regulatory sandbox is likely to result into regulatory change. In fact, it's the expectation that it will. So the regulators are already setting up a sandbox knowing or understanding that what they want to do with sandbox is to promote a certain regulatory change. Um, and, uh, and that comes with the intentionality of how the regulatory sandbox is designed and how the test is run so that it really yields insights that then can be used in the regulatory change process. So I, I can give two examples. One is the equity crowdfunding regulatory sandbox um, in Kenya that allowed equity crowdfunding to test. And that test was one of the inputs that informed the, the regulatory framework for equity crowdfunding there. And then there is another example from Malaysia of EKYC and remote onboarding, where again, regulatory sandbox test results were used as one input uh, in the regulatory change uh, process. I would just underscore that it was not the only input, but there was this intention to change the rules and use the sandbox insights to inform that regulatory changes. That's probably really the common, the common theme for, for the sandbox. Great, thanks Ivo. Um, maybe for the interest of time, we'll move on to Sean for the next section. And there's a couple more questions um, we could address either in the chat or in follow-up. 
Great, thank you all. And, and maybe also in the interest of time, I also suggest that we skip forward in this section um, to, uh, to slide 41. Um, and this is just really to, to introduce um, the, the, the actual toolkit that we've, we've created here in, in, in the guide and just kind of to talk briefly about the, the structure of the instrument and then you know, also how we imagine, you know, particularly like uh, technical assistance providers, folks at USAID and others um, kind of using this toolkit in, in the context of their, of their client engagements. If we could roll forward to the next, next slide, please. Great, so um, in the, the technical guide, and we'll, and we'll provide a link to it in the presentation, it's really structured along the lines that we've been talking uh, today. So, uh, you know, uh, tools on objective setting, uh, you know, uh, exploring the design elements that, that Evo just ran through. Uh, we have another section on more of the operational aspects of, of running a sandbox. So if you've made it through this, this analytical process, determined that a sandbox is the right thing to, you know, to offer your jurisdiction, you've uh, worked through the design elements and now um, you know get, getting to more the, the the practicalities of how to uh, staff a sandbox how to connect it to you know existing communication channels or licensing or supervisory processes we provide some you know some uh, you know very very pragmatic practical examples of, of those design elements and then also um, uh, kind of more more detailed guidance on exploring alternatives you know, again, some of the questions that came up in the chat on you know, when and how to choose between a you know, lighter weight fintech or innovation office and the and the, the heavier weight and more resource intensive sandbox um, alternatives. Um, next next slide, please. Right, and then and then we actually go down and provide you know in addition to uh, kind of a, 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 a guidance document, we also provide. Um, template documents that uh, that you can use and these are these are drawn from and, and generalized from uh, sandbox programs um, around the world uh, we have a, a, a sample uh, feasibility plan uh, which again is an analytical tool to help uh, regulators or, or their consultants and advisors understand when and how a sandbox might be feasible um, in your particular jurisdiction uh, we've got a, a stylized but fairly detailed uh, project plan to help think about how to uh, um, again staff and uh, um, uh, document and, and operate um, a sandbox, sample operating guidelines, and then also uh, sample testing plans. Again, all these documents are to provide um, a starting point uh, for regulators who are working with um, implementing um, sandboxes in, in, in their jurisdictions. Um, next slide, please. Great. Um, we also provide tools, um, and this is uh, Evo and I in, in our work, um, you know, in addition to all the all the um, the analytical work um, in terms of designing and, and assessing sandboxes as among a range of alternatives, we also found that there was uh, you know interest globally in uh, in just capacity building on kind of the nuts and bolts of, of running a sandbox. So we've developed um, and delivered uh, a, a variety of different uh, case based workshops uh, to help sandbox teams kind of think through uh, sample applications. Uh, help them uh, kind of work through, uh, you know, designing testing plans from scratch, and we have uh, you know a number of these tools uh, uh, available uh, as, as in connection with uh, in connection with the guide, um, and to be used uh, in connection with um, uh, you know, technical assistance teams advising uh, regulators um, on on these issues. Uh, next slide, please. And here's just the resources. I think these will be available to to participants. Um, uh, after the call, um, and then in well, one more forward, please. Uh, so, and, and in the spirit of sort of you know case-based simulations, we have a, a final exercise here. Um, and Evo, I guess I can I can introduce it, but 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 please uh, jump in as appropriate. Um, but we want to do a, you know, a little bit of a, 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 a short format uh, team exercise, which is based on some of the, the case simulations that we've implemented, usually in a half day or full day format, but we can do a, a shorter version here, um, you know, to help uh, work with, um, you know, a live example um, and kind of talk, talk through a factual scenario uh, to see whether uh, you would recommend a sandbox in, uh, in this particular uh, circumstance. Um, and Evo, I don't know if you want to jump in on any of this, or you'd like me to just kind of keep keep rolling. Oh, just go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the scenario here, and if, again, we're, 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 our USAID colleagues will will break you out into a, into small working groups, 
uh, to kind of talk through some questions, but let me just set the scene for you here. Um, you know, a, a, a central bank governor has, has, has come to you and said that, 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 that she would like to implement um, a regulatory sandbox um, because uh, she feels that it's necessary to, to promote responsible innovation um, in the jurisdiction. And what we have here, we're going to roll forward next slide. I'm just going to give you some facts about what this particular ecosystem looks like. Um, and the exam question will be whether you agree with that recommendation that, that a sandbox is the right tool to implement. So here's a quick, uh, a quick snapshot of the local fintech ecosystem. So there's uh, five firms total, um, uh, two working on kind of bank related infrastructure, uh, two working on uh, new, uh, new digital products related to investment and savings. Um, and then um, um, a, you know, a, 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 an additional firm working on kind of lending and credit. So relatively discrete FinTech ecosystem uh, with innovators uh, scattered across you know, a few different subsectors within the, within the financial sector. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as, as part of the uh, kind of sandbox diligence exercise, we've, uh, uh, the, the regulators commissioned a, a third party consultant to go um, gather inputs from, from market participants about how they, how they perceive the, uh, the uh, environment for innovation. Here are just a few, a few comments and a kind of flavors from, from participants in the marketplace. Uh, you can see there that uh, folks are saying that the compliance process is expensive, um, that the internal team at the central bank uh, you know, lacks some, some technical expertise, um, that the existing you know, regulatory tools aren't really of great value. There's a letter of no objection process, but it's um, it, it's not really sufficient to give comfort to, to innovators who are trying to raise money in the capital markets. Um, and there's this, this general patina that the, the regulator doesn't necessarily have a good understanding of, of the marketplace. Um, next slide, please. And here, I don't know if you can quite read the, 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 the slides are quite small on, on the screen, but there's um, again, some more feedback from the marketplace. Um, uh, the, does the regulator support innovation? You know, most people say maybe, <laughs> some say not at all. Um, there are some uh, insights on what the perceived barriers to innovation um, are. You can see down there at the bottom, uh, talent, talent and capital are perceived as the major barriers to innovation, but then you know, regulation figures in there as well. Um, and then final question, you know, what regulatory frameworks would support innovation? We see a, per our research uh, uh, earlier that uh, most participants say sandboxes will be useful, but they've also flagged a handful of other regulatory tools that might help support innovation in the market. Um, next slide, please. Um, the statutory mandate uh, is here for the central bank uh, to, uh, to maintain monetary stability, financial institution stability, and payment system stability. And then next slide. Right. And then this is uh, uh, prior to going into breakout here, sort of the exam questions. You know, do, you, do you agree with the governor's recommendation that a sandbox is, is, is the right tool to launch uh, in this marketplace? Uh, why or why not? Um, and given these facts, you know, if you would recommend any alternatives or compliments to a sandbox, you know, what would they be? Um, so we'll have some breakout rooms here. I'll hand it over to USAID to kind of tell us the logistics, but we'll we'll go into breakouts, we'll, we'll chat to these questions, and we'll reconvene, you know, at the at the end here for for feedback and any any wrap up uh, wrap up questions. Thanks, Sean. So in just a few moments, you will be invited to join a breakout room. Uh, please do click accept to the little pop up window and you will be automatically taken into a smaller room. Here you are invited to unmute your microphone and please do enable your video so you can speak speak to your smaller group and um, we do invite you please to avoid clicking leave at any time and you will automatically be redirected back to the main space when the time has lapsed. With that being said, we will now invite you to join the breakout rooms. Find that there are other papers and, and a lot of other materials. So I would encourage you to go there. Um, and if you want to get in touch, also you can use the sandbox at cgab.org address and just reach out and, and, and engage by author. All right, that's about it from uh, my side. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for your attention and, and participation and for 
USAID to, to, for, for the organization of the session. We would like to ask your feedback, obviously, now. So over to my USAID Great. colleague. Yeah, maybe while you all are giving um, your feedback, I just want to say thank you so much to Evo and Sean uh, for this presentation. I know I personally learned a lot. Um, really appreciate how you you know walked us through the toolkit, and then having that practical exercise um, was really great to apply all of our learnings. And, and thanks for these additional resources too, so that we can you know continue learning and applying this in our work going forward. Um, thank you everyone who joined today. I really appreciate your active participation. Um, great start to Thursday or end to Thursday, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining. Thank you, the Market Links team uh, for organizing. And I think now I'll hand it over to Janina. Thanks, Allison. And thank you everyone who have kind of stuck with us throughout this session um, and learning about this really, really fascinating topic. So please do complete the final poll questions that you see on your screen, as well as do let us know in chat what additional questions or comments you may have. Uh, when you've concluded with both of these, you are invited then to go ahead and exit out of this session as you would any other browser. Uh, you'll note we've included a USAID email address for follow-up in chat. So that will be um, Allison's email address, A-H-A-R-R-E-L-L -L at USAID.gov. And that brings us to the end of our session. Thank you everyone again so much and do enjoy the rest of your day, no, wherever your feet may find you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.